Okay, uh, in the uh, last lecture we learned about convolutional neural network and before that we learned about uh, regularization and optimization. There are a couple of more things about regularization that I want to uh, talk about. These type of regularization mainly introduced for convolutional neural networks. It can be applied to other type of networks, but it can be understood the best in the context of convolutional neural network. So we learned about batch normalization, and we start from the original paper of batch normalization when they had uh, basically the <laughs> idea that the problem in, in terms of optimization, one of the problem in terms of optimization is internal covariate shift and they wanted to normalize each layer to take care of this uh, basically internal covariate shift. And later on we learned that uh, the intuition is not correct, that the method works pretty well but the intuition is not correct. We learned that uh, basically uh, batch norm doesn't fix covariate shift and uh, on the top of that, covariate shift doesn't harm if we intentionally, you know, make covariate shift. It doesn't make the situation worse. And uh, the, the bottom line was that uh, what batch norm does, in fact, is to reduce the lifshitzness of the, uh, basically, the, the loss function and make it more smooth. So it makes smoother and less Lipschitz. One problem with batch norm, regardless of the reason that it works, is that batch norm is problematic when the batch size is small. If batch size is small, then using the batch you want to find the mean and the covariance of the batch and then normalize your data based on this mean and covariance. And with a small batch, the mean that you compute and the variance that you compute is not reliable, okay? And there are a couple of ideas to get around this problem. So let's recall the data representation in convolutional neural network. I, <clears throat> uh, we discussed that data is represented in terms of tensors. And in this tensors, uh, we have some batches, n is the number of batches, and then we have usually two-dimensional images which has uh, height and width, and then we have a couple of channels. As input, if you have colored images, there are three channels, red, RGB basically, right? And if you're talking about <coughs> uh, not input, you know, other layers, usually we have a couple of feature maps and you can think of those as channels, right? So you can think that your data either at the input level or in the, or in the like hidden layers can be seen as tensor. Now, batch norm in fact, okay, let me, I mean tensor is not easy to uh, visualize. Suppose that you have a matrix if you have a matrix, you can take the average column-wise or you can take the average row-wise, right? You can take the average of all columns, if columns are your data points, for example, and rows are your features. You can take average of your features if you do row-wise. Or you can take average of columns if you do column-wise, right? So think the same about tensor. You know, if you have a tensor, um, it's, it, in fact, it's four-dimensional, but we show it as a three-dimensional and we put H and W as one dimension. Uh, these blue, uh, basically, uh, squares are those that have been normalized, means they have same mean and they have same variance. This is what's happening in batch norm. Uh, around, along this direction, direction of batches, all batches in the, uh, all data points 
have the same mean and same variance. But we have another technique that I want to introduce now, which is called layer norm. And the only difference between layer norm and batch norm is that instead of taking the average, uh, pulling all data points, you will do the same thing but pulling all channels. So it, again, recall this matrix. You know, we can take the average column-wise or row-wise. So instead of taking the average uh, along this direction of the tensor, take the average along another direction of the tensor, okay? So basically, uh, if you want to see it mathematically, it's exactly the same. You are going to find the mean and you are going to co uh, compute the variance. But the difference is that when you are taking the mean and variance, you do it for height, width, and channel, and not for uh, examples, not for data points in the batch. Then uh, you have the mean, you have the variance, do exactly the same that you did for batch normalization. I mean, subtract them and then uh, introduce new parameters uh, to, to scale the data, to uh, shift the data, and then learn those parameters. Okay, that's the difference between layer normalization and batch normalization. But layer normalization works better in the case that the batch size is small. Okay. Uh, there is another technique which is more recent. It's called filter response normalization, FRN. Uh, 2020 CVPR, the first time this was introduced. Uh, you remember when we revised the insight of batch normalization, uh, one of the founding of that paper was that uh, batch normalization is not the only way to normalize the data, so we usually divide by the uh, variance, but instead of dividing by the variance, you can divide by the norm, right? Okay, now assume that you divide by the norm, you normalize each data point. So in this case, you don't need to compute the variance of batches. Even if batches are small, you don't need to compute any statistics of batches. You know, for any point, you divide it by the norm of that point, right? So we can normalize. <clears throat> and this is basically just to show that this is uh, the mean of Z. You know, if this notation might be confusing, you know, remember that we have four dimensions. So we are mm, going through I and J only. Means that if you have images, you know, you have uh, If you have images, you just take the average of this images, you know, and n here is not the number of batches. I'm using the notation of the original paper. So n is the number of batches here, is, is the number of pixels here. So you basically are just taking the average of your data point, okay? And you normalize with the normalized Z, with, with the average, call it, with, with, sorry, with the norm, uh, compute the norm and call it Z hat. And then you remember after normalization, you know, post-normalization in batch norm, when we subtract the mean and divide it by the variance, we introduced these two new parameters to the problem, which was a learnable. Now do the same thing, you know. So what's the difference? The difference was that in batch norm, take the mean out, divide by variance, and then rescale and add some shift, introduce some shift to the data. Now, we don't take the mean out because mean may not be reliable because I have a small batch size. Don't compute variance, just divide it by the norm but introduce this uh, rescaling and shift. 
since you divide it by norm, since this is not z, this is z hat, and it has norm 1, rescaling usually is not problematic. But since you haven't subtract the mean, introducing this shift might be problematic. You know, the, the mean of your data is not 0 anymore, and you are just introducing some shift to the data. It may lead, I mean, I'm, I'm assume that your activation function is ReLU. If your activation function is ReLU, a problem which could happen, uh, I mean, there is a problem. This problem is called dying ReLU. And this may happen during this process. What's dying ReLU? You know, this is a uh, ReLU function, right? activation function. So anything at point zero, you know, we're going to decide. Anything negative will be zero. Anything positive, we are going to pass it through, right? So basically, ReLU is going to be max zero and x, right? This is zero. If the data is shifted, say for example, the data, the mean of the data is not zero and the data is shifted somewhere here. Most of the observation are going to be negative. So ReLU is going to basically decide that all of them are zero. You know, this is what's called dying ReLU. Or if the data is shifted somewhere here, the, the, the ReLU is going to decide that none of them is zero makes no sparsity, pass all of them through. And the gradient here is 1, okay? So in, in updates, you know, I'm just accumulating these weights together, right? So in this case, everything becomes 0. In this case, weights are going to explode because I'm just accumulating them, you know, and never they, uh, they are zero because so the idea here actually is to define what's called threshold linear unit and threshold uh, ter threshold linear unit is has this form you know remember that ReLU was max x zero so let's define max x theta so in fact let's set the ReLU not at Z, to decide not at zero, but decide at theta. And theta would be somewhere close to the mean of the data. Okay, So basically, if the mean of the data is here, my ReLU is going to have something, a form like this. But theta is learnable parameter. I'm going to learn it through backpropagation. So network is going to decide where the decision point to set zero, I mean negative or positive, or zero or x is going to be. So in um, this technique, basically, you can imagine that everything is the same as batch normalization. Uh, everything is the same as post normalization in batch normalization, means defining a scaling and shift. Uh, a scaling is not going to be problematic because we normalize each data point by dividing the data point by its norm. Shift is going to be problematic because we never subtract the mean. And to take care of this, we just introduce a new parameter to the network to, instead of shifting the data, let's shift the ReLU. Okay. This is called FRN. Uh, filter response normalization, which is relatively new technique. <clears throat> yes. You can actually, you know, there are a couple of other type of normalization here which I didn't talk about. And one of them is group normalization. It's group normalization is sort of uh, 
generalization of these techniques. In, in, prac, in, 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 in principle, you can do any type of these things in group normalization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, basically, you can do any type of normalization. Okay. Uh, okay, something interesting here is that, you know, batch norm works with wrong intuition. There are a couple of, I mean, some people showed that, okay, that's not the right intuition. It works for a different reason. You reparameterize the network and it, re it make it more smooth and so on. And then some follow-up papers like this one in 2020 and 2021 follow the exact same wrong intuition from the beginning, you know. I mean, again, they are trying to fix covariate shift. Again, it works, you know. And... Uh, these two techniques that I just introduced, they're again trying to fix uh, internal covariate shift when we learned that covariate shift is not a problem. But again, I mean, technique works. It's, it's some sort of indication that, uh, or maybe when I introduce the last one, you're going to appreciate more that it's an indication that we don't fully understand what's going on in optimization of neural network. And I mentioned in the first lecture that Still, I believe that the optimization would be one of the main problems that we are facing in, in uh, neural network. <clears throat> so this is uh, a 2021 paper, uh, an archive. I mean, I mean, if you look at the, I don't know where it, it got published. You know, it published in 2022. So it's called normal normal uh, normalizer free network. So basically, the claim is that you don't need to normalize. You don't need batch norm. You don't need layer norm. You don't need anything. OK. So OK, how it works, you know, there is a technique. It's called gradient clipping, which we will discuss in more details when we talk about RNN. Because RNN has two main issues. Uh, one of them is vanishing gradient, the other one is exploding gradient. And to take care of exploding gradient, there is this uh, basically technique which is called uh, gradient clipping. And gra gradient clipping means, basically means that if, if G is your gradient, and instead of using G, use G prime. And G prime is minimum of 1 and a constant C divided by the norm of G times G. Okay, how does this work? You know, suppose that the norm of G is huge. That's when the problem happens, you know. Um, you know, vanishing gradient, I think it's clear that why, why it's problematic. You know, the, the gradient is too small. You can't rely on this gradient. And uh, exploding gradient, we'll see in more detail is that sometimes in the landscape, you know, uh, basically it's as if you have like a, a cliff, you know. And then with small changes, you know, you face this cliff and it, it shoot you on the other side of the landscape. You know, you're closing to the local mean, but as if you're facing or you're uh, hitting this cliff and it, it shoot you out somewhere else in the landscape, so you never converge. So that's the problem of um, um, basically exploding gradient. You don't want very large gradient. Uh, C is a constant. You divide it by norm of G and suppose that the norm of G is huge. So C over G is going to be a small, right? And the minimum of one and a small number is going to be this small number. You multiply this by G, so you rescale G and make it a small, okay? But you never change the direction of G. G is a vector. You don't change the direction of G, you just make it small. So you go to the right direction, but with a small step 
in a stuff at large. Um, and in the case that g is a small, c over g is going to be large and the minimum is going to be 1. So you keep the g, whatever it is. You know, in, in, in the case that g is a small, you don't change it. In the case that g is large, you make it a small. Okay? That's what's called uh, gradient clipping. It's not mathematically sound, but it works, you know, because it's not mathematically sound because you're saying that this is the gradient, okay? Um, assume that this is the gradient. <laughs> Something else is gradient. It's, it's smaller. I mean, it's not, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a hack which works in practice. The idea here, actually, the idea of a uh, normalized free network is that use these uh, clipping gradient, which has been around for many, many years in RNN. Uh, except that this make, except that make the C dynamic. It's not a constant anymore. I'm going to change the dynamic through training. And uh, it's completely heuristic that how to change this dynamic. It's not like mathematical, you know, uh, der derivation which tell me that that would be the optimum C. So it's, they can do many different things, but that's one of the things that they do, that the C at time T is some alpha and uh, alpha beta are like hyperparameters. And the mean of the gradient in the previous uh, iteration. Okay, and you can basically compute this without cost. You know, you can accumulate the gradient over time, and uh, so you don't have this mean all the time, or this norm all the time, or this accumulation all the time. And you can take the mean, and these are two hyperparameters that you define. So over time, the C will change, and uh, they were able to train a ResNet, which is quite. He, I mean, a, a huge model with many layers, without normalization, without batch norm, without layer norm, without any type of norm. Again, another indication that, you know, we had the idea that you have to fix the covariate shift. It turned out that it's not covariate shift, so we had the idea that you have to make it smooth with reparameterization. And now, all of a sudden, someone says that, okay, no, the, the main problem was that the gradient was large and we had a problem similar to exploding gradient and if you control that, everything is fine. You don't need to normalize. Yes? Why do you need learning gradient at this point? Because you're gonna, your gradient is going to be taken care of. Learning grade? Yeah, the amount, of, like how big it is. Mm -hmm. That's your step size in China. So why do you need to multiply by learning grade? So learning rate basically, uh, I mean, you can think, I mean, one way of interpreting this or maybe is that you're, you're saying that we are playing with this learning rate and we, we adopt this learning rate somehow. I mean, I, I'm sure that you can rewrite the whole formulation in a way that, uh, or let me say, not, let me don't say that I'm sure, I, I think that most likely can rewrite all of these update formulation in a way that an uh, adaptive or dyna dynamic value of learning rate take care of this, you know, a learning rate which depends on the value of the gradient in the past and in the beginning. But uh, at the moment, that's not how we deal with the learning rate. The learning rate is either constant or we uh, just make it smaller and smaller by, by more iteration, right? It's not computed based on the gradient and the previous step. And this is a formula which basically compute, I mean, rescale the gradient based on the gradient of the previous step. Uh, any other question? Okay, and um, these are some famous CNNs. Uh, AlexNet, we talked about AlexNet, we didn't talk about the structure of AlexNet, but AlexNet was basically responsible for making deep network, getting more attention. 
uh, and uh, after that, you know, we have a Google Net, ResNet, DenseNet. We briefly talk about these two, and uh, the most recent one is this ConNet in 2022, which is a state of the art in many applications of uh, basically image processing and vision. We don't go through the details of them, but uh, there is nothing fundamentally different from what we learned in this class. You know, it's just different structures. You know, how we put the pooling, how we put the uh, how many layers, and how we combine them. Nothing fundamentally different from what we have learned. Just different structures that you can uh, learn by yourself. Okay, another important topic that, unfortunately, we are not going to talk much about in this class, unless we have time at the end of the course, is uh, neural architecture search. Uh, when we talked about convolutional neural network, I told you that uh, you, know, you can assign weights randomly and basically by some trial and error if you want to decide about the structure of the network. You may be able to use this technique, basically, in you know, stuff learning, you know, by just assigning some random weights to decide what would be the optimum structure, the optimum number of layers, and so on, and then start to learn, you know. But that would be the uh, maybe one of the naive way, naive ways to uh, come up with the optimum structure. There are techniques, actually, to come up with uh, optimum structure. And there are techniques to search in the space of all possible structures and find the best one. It's huge literature, actually, around that. And uh, we have a loss function, usually, which depends only on accuracy, right? Now, suppose that you have multiple objective functions in terms of accuracy, in terms of model size, in terms of the number of layers, in terms of whatever, pooling. So you're not just optimizing for accuracy. You know, you have multiple objectives, and these objectives are size, layers, and so on and so forth. And you want to search in this space. Okay, so we can search in this space, but it's going to be pretty expensive search because you have to train each of these models one by one and then decide which one is going to be better, which is not practical. This area of uh, searching a structure basically is based on different approaches and different ideas to make this um, hard problem approachable. And there are three main, uh, basically, uh, ideas or three main uh, stream in this uh, basic NAS uh, uh, search. One of them is based on Bayesian optimization and one of them is based on uh, differentiable approximation and the third one is based on kernel methods. I believe this third one is the most interesting one. Uh, we don't go through the details, but uh, through some heuristics, you know, you try to make some sort of differentiable objective function, not for just for accuracy, but also for a structure. And so not choosing all possible structures, which is hard, instead take using, you know, the direction of uh, mm, gradient, but not gradient just for optimizing the accuracy. A gradient which optimizes the structure as well, but these are some heuristics which you let you to make uh, some loss function, multiple loss function, which not involves only accuracy, but it involves uh, structure and so on. This last one is quite interesting. You know, it can show that uh, if you have a network, a single layer network, but the number of nodes in this uh, 
layer uh, approach to infinity so if you have one layer with infinitely many nodes you can think of this as a kernel and then many techniques in kernel approximation can be applied here and uh, without <laughs> going to details there are techniques that basically look at this network as a kernel and uh, work with this kernel computing the like an eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this uh, kernel and decide about the structure based on that. I mean, theoretically, this last one is quite interesting. If you have time at the end of the course, we may have some uh, basically lectures on that, but not now. And th that would be interesting topics for your uh, paper presentation as well, if you choose papers uh, related to this. <coughs> Okay, um, so that was, that conclude CNN. Uh, I was looking at leaderboard of data challenge and uh, not all of you submitted, some submitted and I believe that performance could be better than what we see at the moment in the leaderboard. So, um, I decided to give a pretty quick introduction to, it's not a programming course, but it might be helpful for you to, if I give a pretty quick introduction, how to put a network together. And uh, your TA, Tianchen, is here actually, and after me is going to give you some tips about the data challenge and uh, how we can make the performance possibly better. Okay, this is uh, just, you know, we have some tutorial example and sample codes on the web page for different models for fit forward and for CNN. Just going through uh, one of them quickly using Keras. Uh, these days actually PyTorch is more trendy compared to Keras uh, and it gives you more control Personally, I like Keras better than PyTorch if, if the job is not that complicated because in some jobs you need that control. But Tianxin is going to give you tips in, in, in the framework of PyTorch. So suppose that you want to implement the fit forward neural network, for example, and there are three steps that you have to take in when you want to implement anything in, in Keras or PyTorch. There are these three steps that you have to take. So there are some, import some libraries that you do this whenever you want to use Py, Python, right? And one of the libraries that you uh, import is Keras itself and you import NumPy and so on and so forth. And uh, Okay, after you import uh, these libraries, so let me run this. And here actually to see that what type of device we have, we have CPU or we have GPU. Uh, the, the next step is to load data here. In this case, we want to use uh, MNIST, okay? So uh, Keras has access to many of these data sets. You can just say that uh, import MNIST, right? And uh, <clears throat> when you import MNIST, it's going to be in this format. It has a training part and it has test part. Uh, if I want to show you the shape of this data, you know, the training data is 60,028 by 28. And the test data is 10,028 by 28. So I have 60,000 images. Each image is 28 by 28. 
So uh, this is sample of these images if you want to. So, so this index is just random. I choose randomly one of these points. You know, these are handwritten digits, uh, 28 by 28. So we want to classify them. So our job is classification using a fit-forward neural network. The first thing that you have to do is to reshape them. You know, this data is in the form of a, a tensor. So 28 by 28 by 60,000. But you want to make them 60,000 by, what's 28 by 28? I don't know, 700 something. You know, you want to vectorize it. So uh, here we are going to reshape the data See, it's 60,028 by 28, but I define my training set here to be reshape of the training. And X train shape 0 is 60,000. It's the tensor, you know, the first dimension, 60,000. X train shape 1 is 28. And X train shape 2 is 28. So X train shape 1 times X train shape 2 which is 784, a vector of length 784, and I'm going to have 60,000 of them. So I will reshape this tensor to a matrix of 60,000 by 784, which any, each of these 784 vector is going to be one data point. Okay. So um, yeah, we reshape the training set, we reshape the test set. And uh, one good practice is, most cases, is to normalize data. So uh, this data is between pixels or between 0 and 255. It's a good practice here in, in many cases to divide the data by the maximum value and make it between 0 and 1. So we divide everything by 255 here. So we normalize the data. So here the mean is 0 and the max is 1 after normalization. Before that, the norm was uh, 0 and the mean was 0 and the norm was, uh, the max was 255. And then I have to fit the model, you know. I define the batch size, how many epochs I want to go. And say I want to go 20 epochs. And that's it. You know, uh, this is the first epoch, and you, your accuracy is 0 0.1, and the loss is 0 0.09. And as it goes uh, on, you can see that the uh, accuracy gets larger, so the model converges. And the loss function gets smaller. So it means that we are in the right track. OK? <coughs> and it takes some while to converge. And 20, most likely, is not enough. Um, but then you can easily pass your test data to your model. And you know it's eighty percent, eighty-three percent. You know if you go for more epochs, it's going to be better. So you can pass the test data and uh, basically predict. So this is my prediction, for example. This is the grand truth, and this is uh, what we predict: eighty percent correct or some something wrong. For example, here it was six, and we predicted five. Uh, Just to show you that, uh, you know, in many of these cases, you have many choices. You know, we, we, we define activation function to be ReLU. Uh, it could be many different things. It could be sigmoid, it 
can be tangent hyperbolic and all of them are built in. You just change relu to T A and H and the activation function is going to be tangent hyperbolic or this is relu. Or soft plus or leaky relu. You know, there are many things that we can look. And for the last layer, usually we use soft max because we want the last layer to have, you know, interpretation in terms of probability. <coughs> and uh, these are other parameters that you can define in a uh, basically a dense layer. Uh, is regularized or not regularized uh, can take up we can look at this I'm not going to go to details as I told you drop out is a layer if you need a drop out you can just add a layer the same way that you added a dense layer you know you can say you know you we had add dense 128 for example I want to add you want I want to do drop out after that just say add drop out and the parameter of drop out 0 0.2 you know, this is the parameter of the Bernoulli. I want to do batch normalization. Again, batch normalization is just a layer uh, which I'm going to add. <coughs> and we, did, we used mean a square error. Instead of mean a square error, there are many other available loss function built in that you can choose and uh, work with them. We used SGD. Again, there are many other built-in that you can use, like Adam, for example. And we talked about different techniques for optimization before. <coughs> and uh, let me show you pretty quickly. Another network, <clears throat> which is a CNN that was uh, for fit forward. You know, the first step is the same. You just input some, you know, libraries, including Keras, and uh, In this case, actually, the data set that we're working with is uh, CIFAR 10. I just defined the batch size, uh, number of classes, which is 10, number of epochs that I want to go. And <clears throat> that was the first step, similar to what we had before. And then we upload the data again, similar to the way that we did it for MNIST. You know, we just uh, import C for 10. And again, you reshape it the way that we reshape it for MNIST. Um, again, I switch to flow 32. I divide by 255. These are all steps that I took in uh, fit forward. <clears throat> And just to see some samples, this is 20 by 20. These are samples of CIFAR 10, 10 classes, with some realistic images. And uh, categorize the, the Y, you know, the same way. I mean, make it one hot vector, the same that we did it for uh, MNIST. Okay, this is something new, which we didn't have it in, in the previous model. You know, we talked about data augmentation, right? In data augmentation, you don't need to explicitly generate those data and add it to your data set. You know, you don't want to rotate some of them and add, noise and add it to the data set and so on. There's a function here for data generation, which has many parameters, you know, and you can play with these parameters and say that, for example, you don't want to rotate, but you want to shift uh, 
the width and you want to shift the height and you want to horizontally flip and you want you don't want to vertically flip you know there are many parameters when you want data augmentation these are the type of augmentation that I want and these are the type of augmentation that I don't want so you just set these and at the time of training you call this function and this function takes a data point from your training set, apply these transformations on it and pass it to the model. Rotate it and flip it or whatever, you know. So this is for data augmentation. <coughs> and then the step three, which is model definition, pretty similar to what we had before, but in a step dense, we are just uh, add convolutional layer. In this case, <coughs> you know, the first layer is a convolutional layer and the size of the kernel that I'm going to use is 3 by 3. The size of the kernel or filter is 3 by 3. And I'm going to have 20 of them. Okay. And remember that when we are doing convolution, we can uh, just convolve the kernel to the image or we can extend the image. And then we extend the image, which is called padding. We can do zero padding. We can, when we extend an image, you know, I can add zeros here, which is called zero padding, or I can copy this part here, which is called same padding. You know, after convolving a kernel with your image, if you don't do padding, the feature map is going to be smaller, but you can do padding to keep the same size, for example. Here we do padding same, for example, you know, so it will be copied to all sides. And the activation function is ReLU, and uh, this is the input shape, the size of the input shape. And then I add another layer, and this layer is max pooling, you know. So we said that convolution has three steps, and one of them was pooling, you know. It's your choice to add one type of pooling if you want to, and we added max pooling, and then we added a dropout. There was a question in the previous lecture about max pooling, which is not differentiable, and how we do back propagation. And I ask you to think about this: that do we need it? Do we need to take derivative of this or not? What was the your 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 thought on it? <coughs> Sorry? Mm -hmm. For? Right. You know, when you do max pooling, basically, <coughs> uh, say, for example, I have 5, 3, 1, 8. And in max pooling, I'm going to just pass 8, right? When you do back propagation, the only thing that you need is to know the index of this max. You just know that that was the index. So the derivative comes back going only through this node. Everything else is going to be 0, you know? I'm just going to update this one. So I, I don't need actually to take derivative of this non-differentiable uh, function. <clears throat> Another convolutional layer, again, 3 by 3 is the size of the kernel. And I need 50 of them. Another layer, 3 by 3, I need 100 of them. And at the end, we added a dense layer, you know, yes. You know that the original size was 20 by 20, right? And then you had a, a padding and then you applied a kernel 3 by 3. So it produces a feature size of 20 by 20, but you have 20 of them. So it's going to be 20 by 20 by 20. But in the second layer, again, we applying 50 number of filters. Right. So will that be applied on the 20 feature 
No, it's going to be like a t tw t 3 by 3 by 20 kernel applied to them. When you apply a 3 by 3 by 20 a tensor kernel to them, it's going to make one feature map. But you have 50 of them. So at the end, you're going to have 50 feature maps. Yes? <laughs> yeah, how, how should I know, actually? You know, it depends on the problem, you know, and what type of data augmentation works. Um, <clears throat> okay, you're going to add a dense layer at the end, and the dense layer is, has 1,512 nodes. And uh, basically, I'm going to flatten whatever I have. You know, at the end, I have 100 feature maps. I'm going to flatten them, make, you know, whatever vector it is. It's just a vector. And I pass this vector to a dense layer of size 512 with dropout. And uh, that would be my classifier. Okay, so... Uh, and then again, you compile it. You know, the, the optimization is different here. And then this is the model summary. And then you just um, fit the model, which in this case is going to be uh, more time consuming. So this is epoch one, and we had 100 epoch, and the rest of the lecture is just going to watch this to, until it comes. Okay, so it was uh, convolutional neural network, just an example. Now, 